Christ himself to come down to encourage me about the excavation of the Ark of the Covenant tells me that it's very important to God. The colors of the rainbow are rippling in all directions uh, behind it. We dare not say wait and we dare not say no because if we do, we have thrown our eternal life away. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells you the contrary, that's what God says. That's what God says. God says, today is the day of salvation. That's what God says. I'm here in the home of Mary Nell and Randall, and there is a museum hidden here. And it is showing artifacts from the Holy Land, from Noah's Ark, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Ron Wyatt is on YouTube talking about this, but here are all of his photographs and... and so this is Victoria Jackson, hired by the Ron Wyatt estate, appealing more to conservative Christians and maybe democratic Christians. Victoria Jackson is an American actress and comedian. She once bragged about earning $100,000 a week for having five lines that someone else wrote. And I could do airhead better than anyone. That was my speciality. It would be effortless. Christian conservative background, married to Paul, Weez, L. They do many talk shows where they address moral ethics. A lot of America. people thought Noah's Ark was on Mount Ararat, mm -hmm. but Ron had uh, a theory that was different. When Ron first went there, the Ark, it was even with the ground. It, you know, the sides were pushed up a bit, but it looked like this. And Ron came home and got some of his friends to pray for an earthquake out there because he said, this is so big and how am I going to be able to even tell what it is? So, excuse me, they prayed for it. Here's before the earthquake, here's after. The Bible it says that, that the Noah's Ark landed on the mountains, plural. In the, oh, yeah. in the mountains, of Ararat. In the mountains, not Ararat. on Mount Ararat. Mm -hmm. And so good. we're 15 miles away from Mount Ararat on the mountains of Ararat. Okay, yeah. thank you for clearing mm -hmm. that up because I, you know, the Bible, whatever the Bible says. This is 8 4, is yeah. where we find that. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, what was his second thing he discovered? Okay, uh, after he went to Noah's Ark and discovered that there wasn't much he could do, he came back home and the next year that at that time yeah he and the boys packed up and they flew to israel and they uh drove all the way down to the end of israel to the tip of the gulf of aqaba and hired a pilot to fly them down the gulf of aqaba to see if he could find where the crossing of the red sea took place my good works are you going to stone me they said not for any of your good works but because thou being a man dost make thyself God. Exodus 1.8 There arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. Israel had remained a separate race from the Egyptians and had grown and prospered to such an extent that they were viewed as a potential enemy nation right in the midst of Egypt. Ron Wyatt believed they occurred exactly as the Bible stated. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth. When Ron and the boys first came to Nueva, they went to the south end of the beach. He and the boys then donned their scuba gear and began to investigate what may lie beneath the waters of the crystal clear gulf. On the first dive, Ron found chariot wheels preserved by the coral which had attached to it. Okay, we're out here at the beach that the Israelites came out on when they came out of the canyon system that they had been following by the leaving of the cloud and of course following Moses who was following the cloud. And they came out on this beach 
and proceeded to the south. And so that is where he found chariot parts. Oh, he found, yeah. he found Roman, I uh, mean, he found Egyptian, Egyptian yeah. chariot parts. Right. In the water? In the water, yeah. That were, see, why isn't anyone looking for this stuff? Well, we can't, you can't take it out. This area right here is a protected coral area, and you cannot bring anything out of the water. And so, um, that this was a gold wheel that he found in 88, but all of the others that they found, the only thing that's really left is the shape of a wheel because where the uh, coral attaches to it's anything that's organic, it eats it up but forms a shell around it. So it's just like a fossil. We recognize a fossil by the shape. And we recognize the shape of a, a Egyptian chariot, chariot wheel. Well, right in the middle, it actually goes down. It, it's about 2,500 feet deep here. Wow. Um, either end, it drops down to over 5,000 feet, just an immediate drop. So didn't God mm -hmm. tell Moses where to walk? Like, t was it tapping a rock or something? Well, he told him to stand there and hold his rod up. And when he did that, the waters parted. And what was this? I remember. This was, it was interesting when he first came here and went to the south end of the beach. That is south. This is north. He found this column lying in the water. And he told the Israeli police or um, maybe it was army about the column. And they immediately moved it across the road out of the way. But he, he believes that King Solomon erected those in honor of the crossing of the oh, Sea of Dry Land. Right. Yeah. So he believes King Solomon erected these as this is the spot. This is the spot. Where yes. God parted the Red Sea. That's what it said on the Saudi side. Mm -hmm. well, that's what it said. The, the, Hebrew. Writing, the Hebrew writing on the other pillar. When Ron discovers this stuff, did he tell their their governments, you've got precious things here that should he be did. preserved? Yeah. He became friends with a man in Egypt. He became friends with Nasif Mohammed Hassan. He became friends with Nasif Mohammed Hassan. And so anyway, on that note, I'm going to say I love you. Shabbat Shalom. I love you. Shabbat Shalom. Friends with Nasif Mohammed Hassan. And this was before Egypt had uh, really organized into what they have today. After the Red Sea crossing site, of course, we knew Mount Sinai had to be in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And so then Dad tried to get permission for four years to go to Saudi Arabia. So we could prove that that's Mount Sinai, here's where they crossed, everything, the whole bit, to give everybody the whole story. And uh, they wouldn't give us permission. And he kept applying and kept applying. They would not do it. Our dad didn't want us to go to Saudi. We were in Jordan. He wanted us to stay in Jordan, just hang out. We had money, go eat and do whatever, just wait for him. And we said, no, you're not going. You know, we couldn't let him go by himself. Because so, he said he was going to sneak over. But he did not want us to go. He said, we're going to have to go through the border. And I said, Dad, I said, we're going to go to jail if we go through that border. And he said, Ronnie, he said, there's no way I can make it. He said, I'll give you your plane ticket and your passport, and you can hike out. Or you boys, you know, y'all can have them and you can go, but I'm going to have to go through the border. And I said, well, Dad, I can't let you do that. <laughs> they caught us. Anyway, basically, they said, okay, you wait right here. <laughs> and then the military pretty much came and got us from the customs or the border. So um, that wasn't looking good. They had us in the military jail. Uh, my dad had, was in the military, luckily. So anyhow, they figured that uh, uh, it sounded like something to make us stop, but dad had said, don't stop unless they say it in English. So we just kept walking. And uh, they hollered a couple of things and we kept walking. And um, 
so anyhow, they figured that, uh, you know, we weren't a dan we weren't, uh, we got, we lied to them about crossing over, but we weren't a threat. They were thinking we were spies because we were in the, because they saw us in that military area, but then, uh, then they took us to regular jail and they really started interrogating, separating, which I don't blame them because we snuck in their country, you know, but we don't look like Israelis. I mean, uh, I heard later on that somebody had told them that we were coming over there, so somebody set us up. Found out later that a friend of my dad's, who my dad told we were going there, actually called the Saudi Arabian government and told them that we were Israeli spies. And that's why they had been looking for us since he had called anyway. And he had also told another friend, James Irwin, former astronaut James Irwin, who was an archaeologist also, he started a high, the High Flight Foundation, and he was interested in finding Noah's Ark, and my dad took him out to Noah's Ark and showed it to him. And so they were good friends. I saw after we got out of jail that my sister and somebody else had done an interview and said that we were missing, hadn't seen us. I forgot what channel it was, but anyhow, James Irwin heard about it and he knew the king over there, so he made some phone calls and evidently he's the one that got us out. He was friends with Dad, so that worked out good, but that was the last trip I went on Saudi Arabia. After he discovered Mount Sinai, which isn't that where the burning bush was and where yeah. Moses got the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. from God and the Jews were dancing around the golden calf. And so he found a spot where a million Israelis could have been oh, yeah. camped. Easily. And he, so he found Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Did, didn't he find where the, the mountain was burned? Didn't you say yes. it was blackened? Mm -hmm. Explain that part. This is Mount Sinai, according to Ron Wyatt. When Ron saw this mountain, he was like, why is it all black on the top? He noticed that right away because the Bible says Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The area at Mount Sinai is, when you're talking about a million people, at least, because they said 600,000 men. Right. And so they got, they got moms, they got wives, wives children. and children. And so what happened here was a massive, massive city actually had to happen. And this area in here was a lake. And we will put some pictures in there showing that it was um, an excavated lake. It's obvious. He believed that it was for this time because God is going to do everything that he can to offer us salvation. He is not going to let one soul lose their eternal life because they didn't have the opportunity. And that's what Ron believed, and I believe that too. And that's a big range, huge difference. You and I have led tours to Israel, and I, after a week <laughs> or 10 days of 120 people, my, my hair is gray, yeah. my, my hair is missing. Uh, How did they yeah. do two million people logistically? Oh my, so great question. First, there's a big God that made the universe with a word. So really it's not a problem. But the reality is Moses likely had some history with some military campaigns and was a fantastic organizer. Yeah, it had to be that. Now God was helping them, providing food, manna, providing water from a rock, helping their sandals not to wear out. That's what the Bible says. So we know the miraculous was part of this whole story, not just the parting of the Red Sea or the plagues, yeah. but providing and helping them on this journey. That area a little bit. Gently, because if there's a oh, uh, piece of pottery or anything, you bust it if you go big and too big. By all, it's just reach. How do you say that? By all, it's just Boisterous. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. That's mind boggling. 
ordinarily they're cracked a little or they wouldn't leave them behind. Oh, I wow. believe in miracles. Park, Where are you from? Oh, you random thing. Look at it. I don't believe it myself. What we actually have found is physical evidence that this is a boat. Uh, whether or not it's Noah's Ark is up to the people that review the material. Uh, that's up to them to decide on that. My personal feeling is that it is Noah's Ark. Wyatt admits his skeptics are severe, and he has a long road to travel before his theories can be totally tested. The rock, wood, and metal samples are currently being analyzed with reports due on the specimens by mid-September. If it is the Ark, what has been proven? To the people that believe in God, this will be a confirmation of their faith. Wyatt firmly believes ultimately his find will be proven to be that of Noah's Ark. Even then, he says, there'll be some who still won't believe it. As far as the timing of this find, he has an explanation. But I think everything is on a time schedule, and I believe that when the time is right, these things will be brought out. He didn't want them to always live there. He had a land, mm -hmm. a, a beautiful promised yes. land that he had given. So wow. the, the, even the slavery and the awfulness that they had to go through was a way of getting them to want to leave and to go be born as a nation mm. after they had crossed the Red Sea. We are always gonna side on literal biblical inerrancy. And even though it seems too large, God is a massive God and can do massive miracles. And so that's what I'm gonna stick with and I'm guessing that's what you're gonna stick with. Absolutely, there's no reason to make this into a small thing. Yeah. And he simply revealed all of these things in a manner where no one should be misled as to who has revealed this. I'm not clever enough to have found all of these places and uh, objects. So this is something that God has taken into his own hands and is doing a show and tell presentation of his treasures, his archeological treasures in a manner that is designed to strengthen the faith of the believers and to convince those who have seen no good reason to believe what Christians have to say to convince them that the Bible is historically accurate. I believe that those who pass through the grave are not required to know as much as those of us who will be alive at the coming of the Lord. And so God has reserved all of these for this special occasion, special time. So, uh, having found the Ark of the Covenant in 1982 and the tunnel through which they took it into the chamber and out of the city, the Ark of the Covenant passed from, through a system of caves and tunnels right past this area over to where it was hidden beneath the crucifixion site 600 years before Christ would be crucified. And the Romans put the cross hole that Christ was to be crucified in directly above the mercy seat. And all of this was unknown to any human beings, uh, unless, you know, God revealed it maybe to Abraham or some of those. And uh, so anyway, when Christ died, it says the earth shook and the rocks were rent. There was a crack opened up just to the left of the cross hole, went down into the chamber where the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat had been hidden 600 years before. And when they found that Christ had died, when they came just before the Sabbath to take the, the, the victims of the crucifixion down, with the intent of putting them back up after the Sabbath. And the two thieves were still alive, so they broke their legs. They found Christ was dead, so they didn't break his leg. uh, legs. And that fulfilled the prophecy where it says none of his bones were broken because they did know that Christ was crucified there. And then later in AD 70, when Titus attacked the city from the north, he shoved uh, the 
a Griffian wall or third wall to the north down over the escarpment, which made a ramp down to the wall of the city. And that's how he may reach the wall and came in. So the ark rested there undisturbed until 1982 when the Lord saw fit to reveal uh, his evidence or proof. Of Here's the story that uh, Ron Wyatt told me before he died. I sat in his living room and talked to him for three hours about the Ark of the Covenant. He said, Brother Hoven, I, I, I found the Ark of the Covenant. I said, yeah, right. Now, Ron was a great guy. He was the kind of guy that if I was God, I would let him find all these things because he wasn't out for any glory. He's not bragging about it. He wasn't, you know, not looking for money. Just wanted to, hum he's a humble servant of the Lord. He wasn't out for any glory. He's not bragging about it. He wasn't, you know, look, not looking for money. Just wanted to, hum he's a humble servant of the Lord. He had a lot of uh, Seventh-day Adventist teaching in him, which I would disagree with, uh, some of the things they teach. He said, I was walking along the north side of Jerusalem and with an a Israeli friend of mine, and we're walking along, uh, talking about things, and, you know, what happened here, what happened here. Because Ron's been a student of Scripture for many, many years, okay, and knew it extremely well. He said, we're walking along. All of a sudden, my left arm stuck out, and I pointed to this, this garbage dump. <clears throat> There's a pile of rubble been there for hundreds of years, you know, up against the side of this cliff. And there's a road along the bottom. There's a big cliff and, you know, another plateau on top. He said, my left arm stuck out, and my mouth started speaking. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's grotto, the Ark of the Covenant's down there. And his friend that was with him said, what did you say? He said, I think I just said, that's Jeremiah's grotto in the Ark of the Covenants down there. The guy said, well, great, let's dig it out. He said, Ron said, no, I've got to go home and look at the scriptures and make sure this is possible. I said, I don't know about this. So he went home and searched all the scriptures. He found out the Ark never left Jerusalem, at least it's never told that it left Jerusalem, and it didn't come back. All of a sudden, it just kind of quietly disappeared during the days of Jeremiah. The Ark is mentioned up until that point, but it's just gone from, from uh, the scriptures, never mentioned again. Ron is, spends the next eight years, I believe he said, digging through this garbage dump, moving mountains of rubble, it's been accumulating for hundreds of years. He said, as they're digging, now, there's, a, there's a, a wall and then a flat place where the road was and a bunch of junk piled up against it. So they're digging and moving all this junk for, he said, he went over there as much time as he could spare for, a, I think he said eight years. Okay. He and his sons, and he would hire a neighbor, you know, people over there, you know, pay them to come work, moving all this junk. And he said, we finally did a bunch of measurements and figured out that crack in the ceiling goes straight up to the crack that we found earlier, up above from this, where the cross was. He says, I think Jesus, when he died on the cross, the Bible says the rocks rent, and his blood ran right down through that crack, right onto the Ark of the Covenant, which was inside, right below him in 15 or 20 feet of rock. I mean, that sure preaches good. I, can, I don't know if it's true or not, right? But that's the story Ron told me. And some people really blast Ron Wyatt for all sorts of things. Well, he never, you know, they'll say, some of his finds were never documented. Well, that may be true, but that doesn't prove they're wrong. Not documented is not the same as proven wrong. <laughs> A vast difference, all right? And he gets blasted all the time by these guys who... You know, one guy said, how can one, how can one man find so many things? I said, well, how much time do you spend over there? He said, none. I said, okay, well, then he's probably likely to find more than you. <laughs> you don't need to be a genius to figure that out. Um, that's his story. He says he didn't move it. He just went and told the Hebrew high priests or whoever, you know, the authorities, hey, I found the ark. Come with me. He showed it to them. They didn't touch it either. They still haven't touched it. It's still there. Nobody's moved it. He said he wouldn't make a big deal out of it because he didn't want to start World War III. He said, if you go around, hey, we got the Ark of the Covenant. If the average Jew finds this out, they're going to go tear down the Mosque of Omar because they want to build their temple real bad. But Ron said, you know, with a, with a, a jackhammer and 30 minutes, you could knock a big hole in the wall over there and get that Ark, just walk out with it. So apparently they're waiting until the temple's built. At the right time, they're going to go in there. So apparently they're waiting until the temple's built. At the right time, they're going to go in there, take it out, and present it to the world. Anyway, Ron says the Ark of the Covenant is still there. It has two angels looking down at the mercy seat 
wings are touching, just like the Bible says. And the blood ran onto the mercy. He thinks the blood of Christ ran right down onto the mercy seat. Now, I don't know, I can't verify any of this. Good evening, Ron. Thank Hi. you very much for both, all three uh, for seminars. Wonderful, thank you. My question is that you said that you had the blood of our Lord examined by the Israelis. That's correct. What was their determination of that? Okay. Then, now, we won't be able to take second questions. I'm sorry if you're on your second one, please just step out. I love you, but we're running out of time. Uh, real quickly, okay. Now then. First of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from a source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. But he said, he took some of the, there was black stuff all over the ceiling and black stuff all over the mercy seat. Dried blood. He took it back to the hospital where he works, or got somebody to analyze the dried blood, according to him. And they said, wow, this is human blood. It's pretty old, and it's kind of strange. It only has 23 chromosomes. That's what he said. That was a touch the ark, and God killed him. So that's why the Jewish authorities have decided we're not going to touch this until we're real sure we got everything ready. Okay, Not going to mess around with God anymore. So if you don't believe me, look at wyattmuseum.com. Talk to Richard Reeves, uh, or talk to Nell Wyatt, Ron's wife. She can say, look, I knew him. I was married to him for years and years. He was a good, godly man. And I know that he believed that he had to find a way into that chamber so he could bring those objects out. Then one day, he came home, and that changed. He didn't talk about that anymore, and it took him a couple of months before he would tell me that he, he knew that he was never going to bring the ark out, that he would only bring the tables of stone out, or that they would be brought out one day. In the first part, Ron had all these reasons that he left the ark buried. It was hot. He wasn't worthy. He was paranoid about some doctor. And Jesus even stopped by on his way from South Africa to the New Jerusalem to say, God bless you, Ron. But come to find out that was all bull****, because... There are four angels that have the responsibility of looking after the Ark of the Covenant. All right. <laughs> My fourth time I entered that chamber, everything was cleaned out. Every, all of the furnishings of the temple were in the proper positions that they were to be in. Uh, but anyway, when I walked in, there were four angels standing in the chamber. Oh, look, kiddies. And they looked just like people on the streets. When I saw them, I was rather stunned, and I was going to ask, how did you get in here, or something to that effect. But I found I couldn't move or talk or nothing like that. <laughs> Laugh a little more. So one of them instructed me to set up my video camera and aim it at the Ark of the Covenant. They went over, each took a corner of the mercy seat, lifted it up, and said, This little kitty went to market. This 
where your pity stays <laughs> Take the tables of stone out of the Ark of the Covenant. God wants everyone to see those. <laughs> Let's have a big laugh. <laughs> It's nothing to laugh about! In a weird way, I had to sort of just free myself up to believe that it was okay to be stupid or dumb. One day, I woke up from sleep. <laughs> Congratulations! And he was sitting there in bed watching me. And he said, do you remember what you just dreamed? And I said, no. It was early in the morning, and he said, Tender love is blind. You were having a dream and you were talking. And what does any of that have to do with archaeology, Mary Now, I've been caught staring at my lovers too while they dream. And this is exactly what he said to me. He said to me, he said, you were using your video voice. He teased me about it because I have such a strong southern drawl. And I have a northern drawl, and guess what? That has absolutely nothing to do with archaeology and the Ark of the Covenant in the garden tomb where Jesus was crucified and his blood dripped down onto the Ark and it turned into a rock. Ron was allowed to take the rock out, but he wasn't allowed to take the stones or his VHS tape. And he said, you said... This is the first angel, and this is the second angel. This widow pity had roast beef. This widow pity had roast <laughs> ran out of pities. And he said you mumbled some other things. And but check out Mary Nell right here. She keeps looking up and to the right. And according to psychologists, when people do this, they're making shit up. Every once in a while, she does glance to the left like she's remembering something that actually happened but it's mostly she's looking up and to the right, up and to the right. His whole life centered around, around that. Um, and how can that be? Well, it's because he had no interest in anything uh, other than the work that he believed God had called him to do. Uh, he didn't watch television. He would watch cartoons because he said they didn't put anything in his computer, as he liked to call it. That just seems like a non sequitur because the only way I know to watch cartoons is to do it on a television. Maybe Mary Nell was confused with reading comic strips. Ron could never produce any evidence of the Ark of the Covenant for anyone. And yes, he did try. He did try. Yeah, that sounds like a huge problem to pretend that you did something that you never did. It's my belief that when Satan realized that God was going to bring these things out to convince people of the truth and historical accuracy of the Bible, that he raised up individuals who he could influence to be less than honest about what they had seen. These people, he led them to make statements that indicated that they had seen Noah's Ark in many places other than where it really is. Now it's tragic and it's hard to believe that people would deliberately deceive folks, but there are many people who are willing to tell lies just to get a little extra attention or maybe to sell a book. And I believe that that is the reason for all of these many claims none of which are substantiated by photographic evidence or objects taken from these sites or filmed at these sites. And I believe that you and I must be very careful about what we believe and we must ask for proof. Let me know your thoughts about Ron Wyatt and his connections to Israel and his findings in the land of Israel from allegedly Jesus' blood, to allegedly the Ark of the Covenant, to allegedly Noah's Ark, to allegedly a lot of allegations, which was highly publicized around the time with Hollywood, you had Indiana Jones and a lot of movies coming out of that effect in Calibre, introduced into the collective consciousness, whether you were a church attendee or non-church attendee. God has 
preserved and is now presenting evidences of all of the major events that are mentioned in the Bible. And Satan, in anticipation of what God was about to do, has raised up stories about the Ark of the Covenant being in Ethiopia, about Noah's Ark being on Mount Ararat. He has brought all kinds of stories out to try to muddy the water and confuse the issues about these important things. We dare not say wait and we dare not say no because if we do, we have thrown our eternal life away. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells you the contrary, that's what God says. That's what God says. God says, today is the day of salvation. That's what God says. In closing, we got Ron Wyatt for his entertaining archaeological findings that has gone on to inspire many people in fraudulent narrative that cannot be substantiated but sells loads of books reinforcing faith in something that isn't factually solid. Not only that, we got Victoria for doing an amazing job at playing as an airhead while doing an interview with the Ron Wyatt family estate. I hope that this drives more people to the museum so that they can appreciate the artifacts that have been found. I'm not sure if you're aware, but Ron Wyatt, he found the Ark of the Covenant. He found so many things. He found the resting place of Noah's Ark. Um, this guy is an amazing fraudster. And it's just interesting how Rons seem to be able to pull a lot of magic tricks around people. My question is this, and it needs to be really carefully considered by the common people. If Exodus is not a real history, why did they introduce Exodus in the first place? This doesn't just mean Exodus, it means Deuteronomy. It means the curses that people are trying to invoke on themselves. What was the purpose of this? Why is it every so often Hollywood releases a movie on slavery and Hollywood often releases a movie on Moses. Why is it that Moses or the motif of the Exodus is championed by civil rights and it's championed by oppressed marginalized groups? Is this caveat something that's used politically worldwide? And if it is, why is it used? We need to ask more questions about why. We need to not be scared to question the manipulation of the priests. Because if they've been lying about this, why, why, and why? And then how would that impact you on your daily life? Should you revert back to the old ways before you found a religious text? Absolutely not. When I say old ways, I mean living reckless. No, the books are good for that moral compass hence why it's a messianic book but the book is not historical and it's definitely borrowed from mythological accounts look into it don't be scared break out of their programming you are not pavlov's dog you don't have to stand up and sit down at the sound of certain cues amen jesus no, you're more than that. Start thinking and start thinking today. Big up, bless up, one.